I appreciate that. What's up, fam? We still good? Outstanding. So is the room still secure, still safe, everybody? All right, so, so here's the plan. The plan is I would like to uh, offer a couple tools and tips and tricks for you to live a stress-free life while engaging in this, in this super challenging work. And I'd like to start with this thingy. So I asked the team to uh, have these available to you. I'm hoping everyone online, wherever the camera is, has one of these too. I would like to explain to you what it is you're looking at, and then I am not comfortable telling people what to do. So I'm gonna tell you how to use it and you do with it as you see fit. So this is how it works. If you were to ever ask me, do I have change for a dollar? I will reach in my office bag and I will hand you two rolls of pennies. So when somebody's parking their car and they ask me if I have change for a dollar and I give them two rolls of pennies, how do they look at me? Am I wrong? A hundred pennies is change for a dollar, is it not? What about 95 pennies and a nickel? 90 pennies dime, 85 pennies three nickels, 80 pennies two dimes, 80 pennies four nickels. I would like to offer for your consideration, there are 293 ways to make change for a dollar. 293, okay? So if you ask me if I got change for a dollar all day, or how about this? Because when I do this, one of three things is gonna happen. One, you're gonna punch me in the face, not cool. Two, you're gonna walk away not getting the help you needed from me, not cool. Or three, you're gonna give yourself permission to be explicit in your inquiry. Hey, Lonzo, do you have change for the vending machine? I do not. Do you have change for a dollar? All day. Do you have change for the parking meter? Uh, you might wanna be a little more specific. Here's in my experience what happens. We get together, we have all these conversations and we start to ask people, uh, see me, but not explicit on what that means. <laughs> so here's an exercise I'd like to offer to you, do with it whatever you want, but if you wanna have some fun with it, do not let people Google. So we're gonna, we're gonna practice this because it's full participatory and I'm allergic to lecturing. Okay, everybody's got somebody kind of near them, right? Here's the question. What is your understanding of the difference between race, ethnicity, and nationality without Google? So here's what I need you to do. Give yourself permission to take two seconds and think about your answer. And then for everybody's safety, I recommend you start your answer like this. It is my understanding. <laughs> okay, you ready? Here's the question. What is your understanding of the difference between race, ethnicity, and nationality without Google? Go. <laughs> Okay, family, can I have you back? I wanna let you know what I'm biased toward right now. I'm more biased to the skill than your answer, just to be transparent. I'm more biased to the skill. How do we have these conversations in a way that keeps us together? And, and ask me what I understand something to be and I feel safe enough to tell you all day. And no matter what you told your partner, you're right just incomplete <laughs> and you're not wrong 
just incomplete, right? It doesn't feel safe to me to have conversations and somebody's gonna tell me my answer is wrong. And it doesn't feel safe to me to have these conversations where the narcissist thinks all their answers are right, right? Just put a comma at the end of it. So however you answer that question, you're right. So what the government say? That's gonna be our theme. So what the government say? You ready? Here we go. Uh, in the spirit of see it before you see it, I want you to see where we're in conflict before it happens. Whatever you understand race to be your right, government, physical identifier. No, that's it, there's no more coming. What you look like? White, non-Hispanic. Hispanic, non-white. For the colorblind people, anybody confused yet? Uh, black, African-American, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American, Alaskan, I'm not sure what the new word is, but Eskimo I am learning is not okay. And then my two favorite boxes, mixed race and other. You physically look other. Can you appreciate where we might be in conflict, right? Ethnicity, however you understand that, you're right. Government, country of origin. You're 23 and me, you're ancestry.com. Um, I'm Turkish, I'm Irish, I'm Polish, whatever that is, your country of origin, that's your, that's your ethnicity, nationality, citizenship. Now imagine a bunch of people getting in the room to have a conversation about race, ethnicity, and nationality, and we got 30,000 different definitions of the term. How's that conversation go? Can you see where we'd be in conflict? So now we're gonna work backwards a little bit. Again, if I put a kid in front of it, in order to run me over, you gotta run the kid over, and I would hope you wouldn't do that. So let's look at this from the perspective of a kid. Uh, let's see, the hockey season just started, right, is my understanding. So these kids are cheering for their favorite hockey player, and then next year, the Olympics start. They've been cheering for their favorite player all year, and then the Olympics start, and then their favorite player comes walking in holding another country's flag. Can you appreciate how that might be a little confusing? Right? Ethnicity. So, so here's something interesting about my um, learning on the national board of the ACLU. Prior to Roe v. Wade, I'm not sure everybody understood nationally one of the biggest things we were dealing with with the American Civil Liberties Union. Now, I'm gonna test how family we are on this. So can we just go to the, to the barbecue? Can we go to the cookout real quick? Okay. Family, let me tell you something about 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Uh, that's a, I, I feel like it's a white people thing. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. That thing is only as effective as the number of people who participate. If you are white, non-Hispanic and do 23andMe, you get in a full blown 30,000 page booklet down to the village of what percentage you are. If you're a person of color, you're getting a two paragraph sheet of paper with a highlighted continent saying you might be from over here somewhere. From the national, uh, from ACLU, the legal argument is this. We are solving crimes with your 23andMe data. We're taking all your 23andMe and Ancestry.com data and running it through FBI crime databases. And the legal question is, do I need a warrant for that? So let me get this straight. You want me to go to Best Buy to get a phone charger and right next to the phone charger and Bubblicious is a DNA kit. And you want me to buy a DNA kit and swab my mouth and put it in a mailbox on the corner just to find out who I am? Nah, <laughs> I'm good. You can't find a single crime solve of 23andMe data on a person of color because that's not, in my experience, what we do. I don't care. I don't want to know that bad. But now here's the other side of it. In my experience, ethnicity of all three is the one that is, has appeared to be weaponized against me. So follow me on this, as my six-year-old would say, follow me on this. What's today, Friday? Let's say I say something today and somebody's holding me accountable and they're like going off, right? And then they calm down and then they call me on Monday and they say, hey, so listen, that thing that happened on Friday, my bad, man, that was just my German coming out. You know, that's, that's, just, a, that's just a strong Puerto Rican in me. 
You know, that's my that's my Irish. Let me let me get this straight. Because remember, I'm Bruce Wayne. I've been to those countries you just named. Don't nobody act like that. Furthermore, I'm petty. I know you've never been. So you are asking me to excuse the behavior that you exhibited on behalf of an entire group of people. Can you appreciate how that doesn't make me feel safe? Meanwhile, mama is born in Philadelphia, Mississippi. That's as far back as I can go that I know. Will you please tell me something I could say where I go, my bad, my Mississippi was acting up. Can we appreciate that doesn't make sense? Now, if I say my Detroit was acting up, I'm probably getting arrested, but that's not an ethnicity. That's a culture thing, not an ethnic thing, right? So here's what I want you to take from this, right? It's, it's both for our own learning and fun. And second, like how to have activities where you are to have people just make it safe to show, show how they show up. What do you understand race to be? What do you understand ethnicity to be? What do you understand nationality to be? In your experience, which one of these have you felt has uh, been weaponized against you? And let people answer it however they're gonna answer it. Cool? Now, here's where this sheet comes in. As people are talking, I'm gonna ask you if you engage in inquiry, mama would say it's the start that stops most people. It's the start that stops most people. You know how sometimes you wanna ask a question but you're not sure how to ask it? Or you wanna say something but you're not sure, like how do you respond to that? Here's a recommendation on where to start. You be really explicit and you say, listen, I have a question for clarity. Can you elaborate on that? I have a question of, of accuracy. This one tends to blow the whole thing up. How can we check on that? I have a question of precision. Can you be more specific? Notice at no point in time are you sharing how you feel about anything. Remember our previous conversation? It's not your feeling. It's not your conversation. Somebody else said it. Give it back to them and ask them to explain it. That's, that's where this comes in. Fair enough. If I said to you, you know, Aisha, is she in the room? We're gonna talk about her. Oh, dang, okay. If I said Aisha doesn't like tall people, here's what some people would be tempted to do. They'd be tempted to check me on that and be like, Alonzo, I just don't see how that's possible. She's one of the nicest people I ever met. And what you didn't realize is you just hijacked my conversation. You hijacked my feeling. I was sharing with you how she makes me feel and you injected how she makes you feel into it. It's not yours. So if I say she doesn't like tall people, then you go, I have a question for clarity. <laughs> I have a question of accuracy. I have a question of precision. Real quick, I'm 6'3". By show of hands, how many of you believe I'm tall? Okay. And if I played on like 99% of the NBA basketball teams, I'm the shortest person on the court. I am short. How, how many people know um, Steph Curry? You know who I'm talking about, right? Are, do you understand he's taller than me? Steph Curry is taller than me, but on TV, he looks tiny. So what does tall mean? Tall is a concept, right? And so in order to stay in the conversation, we can use these questions. Cool? Okay, so I'm gonna step out of this for one second and I'm gonna ask you a question because I wanna respect the space. Um, when I'm in a room with people I've not yet met to a deep level, sometimes I feel like, like I'm not that summer counselor at camp and a bunch of parents drop their kids off and I'm in charge of the water activities and so i ask all the people i've never met all the kids hey can you swim and of course they all go yeah and then i go in the deep end and they go yeah and then you jump in the deep end and you realize they can't swim how deep can i go so you could save everybody in here if we start struggling a little bit So we're just gonna be selfish up in here, but I appreciate the honesty. So can I go, 
you know what we'll do? We'll work our way into the deep end, and then you tell me when, like, okay, Zo, time out. Cool? Everybody, real quick, identify a buddy. We're doing a buddy system up in here just to check in. Are you good? Everybody good? Okay, here we go. You know how sometimes people go, um, can we address the elephant in the room? Um, I want to let you know that that's what pops in my head. I find the comment or the phrase, can we address the elephant in the room, one of the most disrespectful things you can say in my space. First of all, elephants can't play hide and seek. Do you have any idea how much effort it would take you to convince me that you don't see the elephant? Do you have any idea how disrespectful it is to me for me to pretend I didn't hear that joke you cracked? I didn't see that thing you posted. I didn't see the way you treated my colleague, right? It's an elephant. And let's not like disrespect each other and pretend we didn't see it. Let's just call it out. But I also know it's probably not a good idea to bait the elephant. I just need to let you know I see it. So I will walk in a room and I hear it and I go, listen, not comfortable talking about it. I just wanna let you know I heard that joke. I'm not interested in engaging in a debate, but that post you shared made a lot of people, including me, uncomfortable. I just need to point it out. Because what I'm not sure how to do is pretend like I didn't see it. And I also would imagine it's not safe to turn my back to it. Fair enough. So I would like to reintroduce myself in a way that has not been safe for me to do. Um, but in the last few years, I just decided you know, so I just got to do it. Um, but I need your help. First, I need you to say funny till it's not funny. And then I want you to be thinking about uh, two guiding questions to this intro. What happens when a person feels they've lost both base and place? And then where do they belong? What happens when a person has been made to feel they've lost both base and place? And then where do they belong? So on behalf of my mama, I'm going to ask you, let's have one conversation at a time. Let's have mine because your brain's going to want to have 50 of them. Let's have mine. And then I give you my word. I'm going to make it about everybody. Cool. OK, so here's where the story starts. Hey, everybody, I'm a black dude from Detroit raised in rural Wisconsin. Why do I have to point out I'm a black dude part? Here's the thing, there must be a memo out there. I've never read it. I do not know who authored it, but I'm imagining it reads, it is affectionate to say to a person of color that you don't see color. I'm gonna spell it. I'm gonna let you say it in your head. Do not say it out loud, but however you would say this word, I'm gonna spell it when people say that to me. You ready? D-A-F-U-Q. How you not see I'm black? But I'm not the one making it weird. But apparently, since everybody's got to be right in my space, just incomplete, then I got to start with that. Hey, I'm a black dude from Detroit, raised in rural Wisconsin. And we're in the, uh, on ground of higher learning. So let's learn a new word, shall we? Today's new word is nigrescence. Nigrescence. N-I-G-R-E-S-C-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Nigrescence. The definition of nigrescence is to return to the state of black. It's not a people term. To return to the state of black. So I'd like to explain it in my learning style, uh, which is visual. So I want you to use your imagination and imagine that in this bottle is all pure black paint. Can you see it? Say yes. Okay, and then somebody comes by and then whatever color you can see is your favorite. Somebody comes by and they pour like a teaspoon of that color in here. Can we agree this is no longer pure black? So if I wanted it to be pure black, I would seal it, I'd put it in a centrifuge. You know those things that spin stuff super fast and separate colors and particles? As it's pulling the color out, what we'd say about the bottle is it's nigressing. I'd be returning the bottle to the state of black. Everybody with me? In 1971, Dr. William Cross pondered something. He wondered, can people do that? Can people nigress? Okay, so I'm gonna put all my business out in the street 
And then I'm going to ask you to tell your buddy whether or not you believe I can digress rooted in your experience. Cool? So here's where the story starts. Uh, I failed first grade. Seriously, what do you got to not know in the first grade for a teacher to say, do it again? Color? Whatever, man. So apparently, I didn't know something in the first grade. Teacher said, do it again. Mama said, no, thank you, Detroit public school system. Mama, remember who Mama is, 1928. Mama was never comfortable reading fine print and contracts. Mama did not realize she was having me bust for the next eight years to an all-white, mandatory Polish-speaking school. My second language is Polish. How many of you would have guessed that? Right? So if I'm the bottle, let's put eight years of Polish in there. Whatever this means to you, can we agree this is no longer pure black? Okay? You should also know um, I spent the first 10 years of my life in nine different foster homes. This is not Oprah. I'm not looking for empathy, sympathy, or compassion. For purposes of nigrescence, though, I want you to understand that eight of those nine families were white. So let's put that in the bottle, okay? The coolest man in my life was Father Stan at that, that school I was going to, right? He was the coolest, most consistent man in my life. Um, apparently, I thought in order for me to get out of this situation, I gotta be him. I wanted to be a priest. He had a house, he had money, had a car, he had power as I understood it at the time. I wanted that. So what I did is when I was 13, I left Detroit and uh, I went to St. Lawrence Seminary High School in Mount Calvary, uh, where I lived at a seminary for four years. I went to mass three times a day for four straight years with all boys. I have never been to a homecoming. I have never been to a prom. I have no understanding or experience with any of that stuff that our young brothers and sisters are going through in high school. Now I gotta jump in front of this cause some of y'all looking like super serious. We gotta break this up. Listen, I'm not my mama. When I got the contract, when puberty hit and I read it, I immediately called Father Stan. It's like, hey, you know what? Like ever? We on the same page or I gotta break that down? Not a priest. I got some habits. Not a priest. So let's put some more of that in the cup. Um, then for undergrad, I decided to go to a small liberal arts college where for two years, I was the only black person on campus. 16 cups of white. Take everything I'm sharing with you and then just put it in a parking lot for a second. Would you just hold on to it? Follow me over here. You ever notice how people say a word twice as of saying it twice as a whole new degree of it? Like think about the weather outside. Like it's hot, but it's not like hot, hot. You know, like I'm hungry, but I'm not like hungry, hungry. It's real cold, cold in here. But like, let's, you know, you had a long day, right? You had a long day. And all you want to do is go home and relax, but your best friend calls and says, um, hey, we should go for a walk. And you're like, oh, how far? And then they go, well, you know, far, but not far, far, far. How far is far, far? Okay. Now, everybody say funny till it's not funny. I'm going to give you a couple and to each your own, you decide when it stops being funny. Hungry, hungry, cold, cold, far, far. Hot, hot. Well, yeah, she's smart, but it's not like she's smart, smart. Well, yeah, she's pregnant, but it's not like she's pregnant, pregnant. What's pregnant, pregnant? Yes, Your Honor, I was driving drunk, but it's not like I was driving. Drunk, drunk. Hey, when I go back to Detroit, am I received the same way I left? Can we agree I got a couple nicknames? You want to say them or you want me to? Where you been, white boy? Sell out? Uncle Tom? Can, can we agree I get hit with some questions? Why you talk like that? Why do you dress like that? You eat what now? So I look at family, friends, everybody in that space who loves me, claims to know me best, and I go, why are you treating me this way? And they say, well, Zoe, you different. 
I'm different. Different how? Well, you changed. What do you mean I changed? I'm still black. Well, I mean, you black, but you ain't. What's black, black? I live in Green Bay where they can't stop pointing out I'm black. I go to Detroit, I'm not black enough. Remember the, remember the guiding question? So then what happens when a person feels they've lost both base and place? So then where do I belong? Right? So now I got to give it to you. Can I digress? Look at your look at your partner. What do you think? Can I pull out eight years of Polish, uh, eight white families in foster care, four years of seminary, two years of undergrad? Can I can I pull that out and return to the state of whatever original black is? Can I pull it out? What do you say? Tell your neighbor. I saw that water bottle roll all the way to the front. I'm calling you out. <laughs> okay, so if you're saying no, and I love you, all you're doing for me is validating for me that I, I have no space, I have no place if I can't do it. Because every time I turn around, somebody's pointing out I'm different, right? Some of you are saying, why would you want to? At 50, I have no interest in digressing. At 19, though, I have a very different answer for you. I would like to belong to the community of my choosing, right? So now, real quick, let's make this about everybody in here. Um, be, of, be of Latin descent and not speak Spanish. So, I mean, like, like you Hispanic, but you not like. You know what I mean? Like, like have your parents be born in India. You, they move here to Nevada. They have kids, right? As the kids are growing up, this is what the kids are going to say as they're growing up. Your parents are Indian. You're not. <laughs> right? But every day it's going to be pointed out to them that they're different. And when they go visit India for the first time, where are you from? Why you talk like that? Why are you dress like that? You see what I'm saying? Like there's there's this memo out here on what real is, but no one's ever presented it. So now we've got these spaces where everybody's trying to figure out who the realest person is, and then everybody's measured against that. So in order to digress, what you learn then is you have to hyper correct. I had to hyper correct. If you did not see me as black, I had to be the blackest person you know. Here's the problem. How many people on the planet? Can we agree that every person has their own example of who the blackest person is they know? That means I gotta be blacker than 8 billion other people. How long can I do that? Hey, remember Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Can we agree that Will is black? Can we agree that Carlton's black? Can we agree that Carlton standing next to Will is black? But I mean, he ain't. And we laughed about that for over 10 years, completely forgetting the fact that Carlton grew up. Now, where does Carlton belong? So I'm always mindful, like I'm putting kids in front of it, right? If you're curious how to do this with a kid, I got a simple test for you. Put a, put a picture of a, of a lion up in front of a kid, a lion, L-I-O-N, and, and say, I can find this thing in the zoo, in the circus, or in the wild, which one is the real one? And in my experience, this is what a kid will do. They'll say, the one in the wild is the real one. And I'll go, well, what about the one at the zoo? And they'll be like, well, you know, it's a lion, but it's not like a... Problem is, I've never read a headline that said zookeeper mauled by fake lion. <laughs> Maybe zookeeper forgot that that was a lion lion, right? So here's what I'm asking you to do in terms of language. Please be mindful of the double talk thing. It has more of an impact than you realize. We're in the middle of uh, what Hispanic heritage 
month, right? And then somebody goes, I think for Hispanic Heritage Month, we should serve a Mexican meal, but like a real Mexican meal. What that mean? We have people of Mexican descent, born and raised here, never left here. So what, their food is fake? What do we just say to them? You see, you see what I mean? Like we do this for all these celebrations and I'm asking you if you wanna create this space where everyone feels they belong, it actually starts with language. It starts with language. So then here's the rest of me cause I'm petty and you said I could just be petty with you and I'm tired of updating this. I've graduated from college nine times. You don't get to fail me in first grade. I got issues. I'm coming back to make it clear I can read, okay? You should also know um, I am a father, but not of the priest variety, right? Wife and I have three kids, a 21-year-old named Trinity. I went to the seminary, act surprised, okay? Mondis is our six-year-old, our 16-year-old, and Jarrell is our six-year-old. I've been self-employed for 12 years, and then as a matter of making a personal connection with you, I want to let you know something I did to honor my mom, but I can't look at you while I'm doing it because I'll probably cry if I'm going to be honest. So um, when Detroit filed for bankruptcy, uh, I was thinking about how to honor my mom when she passed away. So I bought my neighborhood, the whole thing. <laughs> I, uh, I own 63 houses in Detroit around my mama's house. I only rent to single moms with a son. Every month mom pays rent, I take two thirds of it and put it in a trust in her son's name. When he gives me a copy of his high school diploma, I give him all his mama's rent money back to go to college. So that's what I do to honor my mom. And can we agree that tonight when I go for a walk with sweatpants and a hooded sweatshirt on, nobody knows this. Can we agree it's possible they may be telling a story about this big black man coming up on the sidewalk with them? And can we agree they're not wrong if it's rooted in their experience? Just incomplete. They're not wrong, just incomplete. When people cross the street with me, I do not receive that all the time with malice. I have no idea what happened to you the last time you was in the dark with somebody like me, and maybe you crossed the street for a reason now, and I gotta be okay with that. You're not wrong, just incomplete. Fair enough? So now here's a, here's a tip um, I would like you to consider when you're having these conversations. Like this bottle, I know my capacity to hold on to information. If you do not let me say something or ask something or get something out, what'll happen is I'll tune you out because I don't wanna forget this part. So here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to tell um, somebody next to you, what, if anything, are you holding on to that I've shared so far? Do you believe you will remember a week from now? Couple things in the way that I ask that. What, if anything, I offer that with humility. I have to be okay with nothing yet being the answer. What, if anything, have I shared so far, do you believe you will remember a week from now? I need you to make a little more room for me because I'm not done. You ready? Go. Okay, so, excuse my interruption. As a, as a matter of skill building, it has been my experience that when I am in potentially highly charged conversation, 
and the person speaks at me for 90 minutes, I'm no longer interested. <laughs> you got to let me participate, right? So, so when you host these, I'm recommending you find a way every 10 minutes or so to give it back to the room. That's where I think we lose people. There's nothing wrong with your presentation. You've overestimated my capacity to hold on to it. That's all. And then I'll ask, is there anything I shared that you would like to hold me accountable for in a non-weaponized way? Remember, accountable in a position to explain. That's all it means. Is there anything I shared that you would like me to explain? Cool. I'm also acknowledging people learn six ways, so some of you are not sure yet, you're thinking about it. Okay, I put this picture of the lion in here for you later as another way to remember nigrescence. Remember when I said, ask a kid which one is the real one? It's interesting how they answer that when they believe that the real lion is in the wild. Um, and I'll go, help me understand why you say that. And I hear what they're doing. Real is based on where were you born? And what do you eat? And how do you live? and how do you behave? And I understand why they're doing that. What gives me pause is I do not know where they cut it off. So let's not make it weird. Can we agree there's black people everywhere? Okay, as a matter of culture, can we agree that you have a culture in your home which may be different than the culture in your neighbor's home, which may be different than the culture on the block? right? And so on and so forth. So whenever I hear my people go do it for the culture, which one? There's some random black dude walking down the street in North Dakota. All he knows is North Dakota. So which one of us is the owner of the real black culture? You see what I'm saying? And then that could lead to conflict. So how about we just be explicit about the culture that you understand and then what that means? So in order for this to work, um, these conversations to work, there, there does have to be safety in the room. To me, that's paramount. And then I need to trust you. So I'm a big fan of cite your sources. I wanna let you know where this model is from. It is not mine. There is a book written titled, Trust and Betrayal in the Workplace. That's the name of the book. Trust and Betrayal in the Workplace. Within that book is a model for trust, and I love it, and I use it every chance I get. So this is how it works. Um, if you draw a triangle on a sheet of paper and then put the word trust in the middle of it and then put one of these C words at every corner, communication, competence, contract, all of that is what makes up trust. So let's, let's define this a little further, shall we? Uh, when we engage for communication, when we engage in dialogue, is it both honest and true? Quick question for you. What is your understanding of the difference between honesty and truth? No, that's a real question. Somebody tell me. Yeah. It is my understanding. <clears throat> so I'm understanding you to say, honesty is my opinion about a truth and truth is there can be more than one that I got it. Hey, real quick, there's something that just happened and it's, it's a skill I'd like to offer to you for your consideration. You ever had somebody ask you a question that they were gonna repeat to somebody else and then what they repeated is not what you said? So this is what I like to do for out of respect and love in the space. If I'm gonna ask you a question that I know I'm going to repeat, I'll look at you and I'll say, okay, so real quick, this is what I'm understanding you to say, which gives the other person the opportunity to go, ooh, if that's what you heard, let me say it another way. Or, yep, you got it. Like, that's, that's why I did that. 
Anybody else? What, what, you're not wrong. Just incomplete. So if that's how you understand it, perfect. Anybody else? How do you understand the difference? Here, let me ask it another way. You know those people who go, can I be honest with you? And then 10 minutes later, they go, fine, you want the truth? First of all, stop doing that. Why don't you just lead with the other one? Second, what's about to be different in what I tell you? Can I be honest with you? Okay, fine, you want the truth? What, what's the difference? Were you lying to me the whole time? Here's my understanding of the difference. Honesty is, is a very selfish, personal thing. It is how you feel about something, how you understand something, your personal preference about something. Honestly, not a good thing of meatloaf. How I feel about it, right? That's honesty. Truth has no feeling in it. It has nothing to do with you. It is measurable. It is verifiable. It is data, right? One is how you feel. The other is measurable and verifiable. When we engage in dialogue, is it both? If it's both, I tend to trust you more. You ever had somebody take you someplace for the second time and then that's when they discovered you didn't like it? And then they go, why didn't you tell me that the first time? Well, because I thought it was nice. You are being, you weren't being truthful and honest and then it led to complication. When we engage in dialogue, is it both? Competence. You have the knowledge, skill, and ability to do what it is you say you're gonna do. If you have the knowledge, skill, and ability to do it and you're competent, I trust you. Contract. Do you keep your word? That's it. Do you keep your word? Notice there's no clean division of it. It's three of them, right? So, so here's what happens. Um, okay, whenever, whenever I, I, I'm, I'm packing my bag to leave, Jarrell, six-year-old, Jay will go, hey, dad, do you want me to walk the dog while you're gone? I can walk the dog while you're gone. And I say, man, that's not something I trust you with yet. Now, if anybody heard me say that publicly to my son, they would form an opinion about what they think my relationship is with my son. What they do not understand is Jay and I just had a super deep conversation on a level he understood. So let's work the triangle real quick. When he said he'd walk the dog while I'm gone, did I believe he was being both honest and truthful? I'm comfortable with the rate. My six-year-old is honest and truthful with his chores. Contract. Did I believe he was going to keep his word? I'm comfortable with the rate that he was going to keep his word. Competence. Let me tell you a little bit about this dog he offered to walk. His name's Bruno. And he turned uh, five months yesterday. He is a bull mastiff. He is 64 pounds. I live in the woods. This dog chases everything that moves, including falling leaves. The dog weighs more than my son. Do I believe Jarrell has the competence to walk that dog without adult supervision? No, but that's not what I said. I said that's not something I trust you with yet. But let me tell you where this matters as adults. Let's say I'm in a space with you, right? And I asked to be a part of that initiative. And I heard you say you didn't trust me to be on that yet. And that's all you said. I'm going to catastrophize this whole thing. I'm going to take whichever one is the ugliest and go, did you just call me a liar? Or I'm going to go, wait, you don't think I have the ability to do this? I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm going to find whichever one hurts me the most. And then I'm going to say, that's the one that you used. That's why it matters when we do this trust thing. It can't just be trust. You have to be more explicit. In what area are we looking at for improvement? Alonzo, I think you're good on the competence. Clearly, you like the subject. Um, I do believe you are committed to this and you want to be the best team member. The thing, though, is you are not always consistent with getting me what I need when you say you're going to do it. 
do you see what you just did? You narrowed down what it is I need to work on instead of just saying, that's not something I trust you with yet. So here's where it happens in the street. Do you trust your local law enforcement? Because if I leave it at that, we're gonna engage in conflict. What I'm gonna need you to do is tell me in what area would you like to see that relationship improve? You see what I mean? Like that's just how quick we can end up in an ugly spot. I don't trust any of them. I'm gonna need you to tell me where. You think they're lying to you all the time? You think they're not honest and truthful? Do you know why I pulled you over? <laughs> I don't know if I believe that, right? Or, or contract or competence, that's where it matters. Now, I'm going to enter us into the deep end of the pool, but I wanna tell you why I'm doing it. John Cotter, K-O-T-T-E-R, wrote a book called Leading Change. And in his book, what he says you need in order to change is a sense of urgency, okay? Sense of urgency. I'd like to add to the model. In order for me to move, I need three things. I need urgency, readiness, and motivation. Urgency, readiness, motivation. Let's define urgency explicit to time. I need to know how much time I have, not stuff like now, soon, later, when you get a chance. My brain does not understand what that means. I need Friday, three o'clock, Monday, two o'clock, December 2nd, 12 noon. I need to be explicit with time in terms of urgency. Readiness, do I have the information and resources I need to move. If I have the information and resources, then um, I'll move. And then motivation, do I understand why? W-H-Y, do I understand why? In your communication, I am recommending you need all three. You need all three. If you're missing one, I will be a late adopter. So, Let's put my business out in the street. I've been doing it all morning anyway. So um, this is about Mondis, the 16 year old. Um, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, we were on the couch, couldn't find the remote. And um, the, the show, My 600 Pound Life came on. And Jarrell, or Mondis looks at me and he goes, dad, are you auditioning to be on that show? And I didn't quite understand it, but then I understood why he was asking me. So I go to the doctor and the doctor says, um, now remember urgency, readiness, motivation in the communication, okay? He says, this is what the doctor said. Alonzo, you know, your blood pressure is pretty high. You might want to do something about that. That's all he said. Which, what is missing in that message? All of them maybe, right? So then I go back uh, several months later and he goes, Alonzo, this is getting, this is getting pretty bad. Don't you want to feel better? What, what's missing? Urgency, readiness, or motivation? So I go back again, and this is what he said. He said, Alonzo, listen, in my experience, at this rate, you have two summers left with your kids. I lost like 70 pounds in like four months. I was like over 300 pounds. What was different about that last message? In my experience, at this rate, you have two summers left with your kids. He put my babies in front of it. I have my why. He said two summers, I have my time. He said in my experience at this rate, I have the information and resources I need. This whole, don't you wanna feel better? We should create an environment where everybody values one another because it would just be a better place to work. You're missing a few things. What's it cost me to wait? I'm not sure what it's costing me, right? So in the message, you need all three. So with that, I'm gonna trigger a couple emotions. I'm gonna put kids in front of it and I'm gonna show you what it's costing us because we haven't figured out how to have these conversations. Okay, 
Um, it is my understanding that in order for me to uh, take a, a product to market, there's a few things that need to happen first. First, I have an idea of a, of a product and then that product is supported and, and then I make a model and then the model is approved and then, you know, I got to test it out on some consumers and then depending on how they respond, then I agree to mass produce it, but I need a partner who sells it, right? So, you know, if it's food, you have a tasting. If it's clothes, you have a, a like a model runway. If it's toys, you uh, you put a bunch of toys in a room with a bunch of kids. We walk watch from behind the glass with our clipboards, and then we decide to mass produce it. And it's at this point I'd like to offer to you the Breaking Bad toy set that comes complete with fake bags of meth. And for good measure, let's teach our kids how to make meth labs out of Legos. But the people who make them don't sell them. You need a partner. So who better than, I don't want to grow up, I'm a Toys R Us kid. Let's put methamphetamine drug dealing toys between Barbie, Ken, and the baby registry. Now I'm going to jump in front of a couple things in case you're thinking it. Yes, it's real. Two, if you're going, it's a good thing Toys R Us is out of business, you're not wrong. Just Toys R Us is not gone. They're still in Macy's and they've been bought out of receivership. They're coming back. But until they come back, guess what? You can buy all these at walmart.com. Remember what I said about five generations inheriting a truth? What if, what if the kid doesn't know that that's a TV show? I would never let my kids watch Breaking Bad. But when he takes his birthday gift certificate in the Toys R Us and he sees this next to Pikachu and he goes, Dad, just relax, it's just a game. Is he wrong? Did he not inherit that? But now here's another one for you. Remember the candle picture? We're all looking at the same thing. We may not be telling ourselves the same story. Do I have your permission to tell you what I saw? And remember my goal, I want you to see it before you see it. I want you to see the conflict we'll be in before it happens. Can we agree that uh, Breaking Bad is not the first drug dealing TV show? You ever seen a toy set with little black kids with fake corn rolls and jeans down here and fake bags of weed and a Lincoln Log trap house sold in the toy section? Can you appreciate how it might make me feel that this is where they drew the line? I hope you know me enough by now to know I think all this stuff is garbage and I wish it never existed. It does not change my question though. How come, how come he gets a drug dealing toy and ones that look like me don't? What does that say a word society's drawn an acceptable line? You see how we got pitted against each other just like that? Where's my drug dealing toy? I can't believe I'd even be put in a position to ask that because I don't want it. But here's the good news, fam. The universe heard me and the universe gave me a toy. You ready? Everybody got their buddy? Playmobil introduced a pirate ship that comes complete with black characters and instructions on how to shackle them to the boat. Hey, how do you play that? We don't, but now I got a six year old that I got to worry about for show and tell somebody bringing a slave ship to school and guess what? Now the teachers can't talk about it. You see what we did? We did that because we couldn't figure out how to talk about it. We couldn't figure out how to engage in authentic inquiry. We couldn't figure out how to let people be right rooted in their experience. They're not wrong, just incomplete. We couldn't figure out how to complete experiences. So now we got this nonsense. And it makes me physically ill. So I like to say, I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part in terms of urgency, 
readiness, and motivation, showing you why this work we do matters and why we need to pick up the pace a little bit. Because now our kids are playing slave ship. Now watch how we get pitted against each other. You ready? You ever seen a toy that looks like the Holocaust? So now I'm gonna be pitted against another community. How come my atrocities on display and theirs isn't? See how messed up that happens? It's crazy, family, it's crazy. So I have one more slide in here and then I have an exercise for us. Listen, mama said, always drink upstream from the herd. <laughs> so here's what happens I am holding myself accountable for this too here's what will happen we'll get together with a group of people that we feel comfortable with and we'll all engage in this conversation right and you know what happens over time with the conversation people start adding their own little stuff to it right we know what the zebra are doing in that water and they're drinking it I would come home and I'd repeat something I heard from the group and mama would go, boy, where you hear that from? And I'd tell her the group and she'd say, you better learn how to drink upstream. Here's my understanding of what that means. No matter what happens here today, go upstream, go read your own book, <laughs> go have your own conversations, go test all this stuff for yourself. You do not have to live off the group. I think this is awesome. And I am learning just as much as I pray I am sharing. And you best believe if you reference the book in your session, I'm going to go read it myself. If you reference the theory, I'm going to go read it myself. If you introduce the skill to me, I'm going to go try it out for myself because I can't live off what the herd does. Fair enough? All right. So in the most psychologically violent way possible, if I tell you I'm about to do it, you can't be mad. I wanna, I wanna leave you one more time with the skill on how to keep your peace, okay? I think what, what is happening is we're all exhausted because people keep stealing our peace and our joy. And I wanna teach you how to not let people do that, okay? Um, I would come home and I'd say something crazy and mama would go, boy, I'm not carrying that for you. And she'd give it back. She give it back. Here's what that means. We can agree that you are not always in control when somebody's gonna jump out of the bushes and say something that could steal your joy. And what I want you to do is not carry it for the rest of the day, I want you to give it back. So I am going to make a statement. The views expressed on the show do not necessarily reflect the views and attitudes of anybody and everybody who looks like me. This is just your brother Alonzo Kelly speaking. Okay, I'm going to say this. I don't necessarily mean it. But it's not relevant to whether or not I believe it. I'm going to just say it because you can't control when someone says it. So I'm going to make a statement and I want you to give it back to me. Okay, you ready? Okay, let's say um, in the hallway I go, Chivalry's dead and women killed it. Okay, don't run me over. Give it back to me. How would you give that statement back to me so you don't have to carry it? I appreciate that. We both might give me. <laughs> I appreciate that. Love it. So I would go, I would go, okay, that's an inter interesting perspective. Help me understand uh, what chivalry means to you. I'm not even sure how to have this conversation. You jump out the bushes at me. So now I need to understand what chivalry means. Can we agree? We might not understand it the same. Help me understand what it means to you that uh, chivalry's dead. Help me understand what it means to you in your experience that it was women who did that. <laughs> Notice how at no point in time did I share in that what I think and what I believe. And I'm not gonna argue with you about your experience. You jumped out at me with that. You take all that nonsense back. Hey, help me understand what chivalry means to you. Help me understand what it's dead means to you. 
help me understand that women did that to you. And I do that all the time. I have these super deep conversations. And then later on that night, somebody will send me a note and go, you know what I realized, Alonzo? I don't know what you think. And I go, I know. Right? Family, I want you to practice that. Please keep your joy because I need you in this. I need your joy to not be taken by people who aren't playing fair. Right? I need your energy for the good stuff. So when somebody jumps out with a crazy claim, if you do not want to carry it all day, give it back. Ask them a question. Cool. I know that you had options for this session, so I remain humbled that you selected this one to spend your time. Um, I do very much see you and I appreciate you. Thank you. Y'all want me to do the next part in Polish? <laughs>